Good morning, good night, good everything in between. Welcome back to our podcast, Literary Ramblings. I am here with my beautiful co-host, Charlotte. Thank Um, you. I am Cornelia. So if you're new to this podcast, what we do is every month we read a book together. We have our own little personal book club. And then we talk about it on this podcast. So this month... It was, well, our months are kind of off right now. We're sort of a mess because we both got busy. And I had a hard time finishing this pick. Mm -hmm. So this was Charlotte's pick. So she's going to tell you what it is, read the back of the book and all that. Yeah. So this time I picked a author that I liked from childhood. And it's Cornelia Funk. And this book is Inkheart. And I remembered loving it as a child. It might have been a case of some rose-colored glasses slash, you know, one of those things where I read the trilogy really close together and so didn't necessarily remember the individual books very well. But this is the back of the book. One cruel night, Maggie's father reads aloud from Inkheart and an evil ruler named Capricorn escapes the boundaries of the book, landing in their living room. Suddenly, Maggie's in the middle of the kind of adventure she thought only took place in fairy tales. Somehow, she must master the magic that has conjured up this nightmare. Can she change the course of the story that has changed her life forever? Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Dramatic music. And, uh, so this... uh, Sorry. Oh, oh, I was just going to say, it's got a really pretty cover with a lizard and a fairy and, you know. Yeah, your cover is slightly different than mine. Yes. The back of the book... Every sentence is, like, the same, but it's, like, it when you're in high school and you're, like, can I copy your work? And you're, like, okay, just make it different. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. how it is on the back of my book from yours. Because so I was reading, I was, like, yeah. oh, yeah, that sentence means exactly the same thing, but it's slightly but different. The words. The words have changed. <laughs> yes. So this so. is the first book of a trilogy. Mm-hmm. So there are the three books. I saw a comment somewhere online, and I can't remember what it was on. But somebody commented about how they were waiting for the fourth book of this series. What? And I was like, is there a fourth book? And honestly, I didn't look it up, and I probably should have. But um, I don't think that's a thing, but... Yeah, I didn't think it was either. It's been a long time since this trilogy came out. But mm-hmm. you know what? It would be exactly like Cornelia Funk to do that. Yeah. Just out um, of nowhere. Because she did that. She did that with Dragon Rider. So I have experience with this author. Mm-hmm. I've read several of her books before this one. I read The Thief Lord, which I remember which, liking a lot. Yeah, and I then I also, I did not finish Dragon Rider. And uh, I never tried reading that one, I don't think. Yeah. And Dragon Rider actually just got a sequel, you know, like 15 years later. So that's <laughs> cool. The Thief Lord, like I said, I do remember liking it. But I also, looking back on it, I'm like, mm, if I read that again, I bet I would not like it that much. So I, it's one of those books that I probably won't ever revisit. And then Dragon Rider, I never finished. Do you still own the book or no? I think my mom has a copy of The Thief Lord somewhere because I'm pretty sure I read it from her library. Oh, so yeah, I definitely own it. So, but um, personally, after reading Inkheart, I have decided that Cornelia Funk is simply not the author for me, despite the fact <laughs> that we share a name. Yeah, yeah, jeez, Cornelia. Yeah. I she's one of those authors that because we share a first name and Cornelia is such like, it's not a super common name. Mm-hmm. So I've always been like, oh, I want to like this author so bad, um, mm-hmm. and I just don't, I just don't like her style. So yeah, uh, although I feel like we both agreed that the book is pretty well written. I mean, it's just stylistically not your choice. Yeah, um, and it is translated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from which German, I never... Right? Yeah, from German. I, I never knew that it was a translated book or that it was published first in a different language as a kid. Mm-hmm. Which, I think, as a kid, you're just not very aware of the broader world or, you know... Yes. Maybe if you go to an immersion school or whatever, you have a little more idea of it. But, yeah, I was surprised this time when I picked it up. And I was like, what? How did I never know this? Yeah. Yeah, so it's translated from German, which, you know what, makes sense that she writes in German because Cornelia is a German name. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is what it is. Um, It's like 535 pages long, though. 
It is quite long. Yep. Which was a problem that I personally had with it because it is really long and the style is very slow. Yeah. It's very descriptive. Very beautiful. I mean, I, I feel like there are several scenes that I felt like I could picture well, but there was definitely some parts where you feel a little like, uh, we could have just skipped ahead through. There's a lot of traveling that happens in the book, and she doesn't cut away from the traveling. It's very much yeah. like you're there the entire time period that the book takes place. Yes. Which gets Which, really slow. And it just it highlighted to me why so many authors just skip those parts. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah. You gotta, like, know when you want to skip and when you don't. But, like, for the yeah. most part, you don't want to spend every second with your character. Like, there's a reason that in, in books and movies especially, you don't really often see characters, like, going to the bathroom or, mm-hmm. like, eating proper meals or necessarily, like, changing their clothes as often as they probably should. Um, yeah. And that's because those are boring parts of life mm-hmm. that nobody cares about. Like, you just take for granted that they do those things. And it's the same way for books. Yeah. You just take it's for like granted a... that they drove four hours. I don't mm-hmm. need to be there for four hours. <laughs> it's a it's a mental shortcut that we all take. That's part of the suspension of disbelief, I think, really. Yes. So, and then a, a few adjectives can describe like, oh, they've been in the same clothes forever, or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. yeah. So there is. It's a very traditional feeling book, and I think it is written a lot like a fairy tale. Um, yes, I would agree with that. So, okay, so about, like, the actual story, because we're sort of just, like, chatting about it generally. Mm -hmm. A lot happens in this, and it's funny because we talk about how slow it is and stuff. But, like, if you sat down and you started describing, like, everything that happens, like, a ton of stuff goes down. Yeah. It just doesn't necessarily feel that way. Because even, like, faster moments, she still describes fairly slowly. So it's great description, and you really, like... If you take the time and you, like, slow down and you really read it, I feel like you can really put yourself there. Mm -hmm. Um, But in faster moments, I don't really want to do that. Yeah. I would like to just get through the moment (laughs) because it's exciting. And when you slow me down, you slow me down. You slow down the action. But it is about Maggie. She is 12, right? I think she's, yeah. Yeah, I think she's 12. And... Her dad is Mo, and he does bookbinding. Yeah, which and, I found fascinating. Yeah. Like, you know what someone... is really funny to me that I just thought of? You know the book, um, oh, what is it called? A Wrinkle in Time? Yeah. That one starts out on a dark and stormy night. Mm-hmm. And the reason that that book starts that way is because the author was told at, like, some event or something by someone else who's, like, who was like really pretentious they were like no good book could ever start with the line it was a dark and stormy night and so she was like well I'm gonna do that mm-hmm. and then she wrote a wrinkle in time and I just realized that this book also starts that way basically rain fell that night a fine whispering rain mm-hmm. yep but anyway that was just a thought sorry it's, a- it's uh, atmospheric no it I, is? I no i like it i i don't think there's anything wrong with that but i just thought it was funny because i just thought of it when i was looking at the first line because i was like oh yeah how does this book start again it's been so long <laughs> it starts with rain also a quote at the beginning of every every Which chapter i did not like because that also slowed me on i forced I myself slow down. to read every one of those but i did mm-hmm. not want to <laughs> I enjoyed them, but there was definitely some, A, some foreshadowing happening in some of them. Um, And B, some of them I was just like, that was weird. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) So, I don't know, hit or miss on that. Yeah. But Okay, so Maggie, Maggie yep, and she wakes up one night and she sees a stranger standing in her yard. And so she goes and she tells her dad that there's some creeper hanging out in the yard. And then her dad's like, oh. (laughs) <laughs> yeah he's very and then much he like goes a knowing and he lets he lets the guy in and mm-hmm. it's it's an old friend and then he's like maggie go back to bed and she's like okay and then we follow maggie yes was another complaint that i had with this book was that we follow, we follow. the 12 year old which like is fine in theory but 12 year olds are usually kicked out by the adults in the room and then they have adult conversations about like the plot and stuff and maggie's not privy to those things so it was a little annoying because and I was like, are... I would like to know these things as the reader, but then I don't get to know them at all because Maggie doesn't know them. And we only know what Maggie knows. 
I guess I guess that that didn't bug me too much in this book though. Like she does a fairly good job of Maggie still at least gets the vibe. You know, she at least does a vibe yeah. check. So there's that. Yeah. I just think but, it happens too much for mm. my personal taste. I guess, and the thing is, I might be giving you some leeway there, again, because I read it when I was closer to 12. Yes. So, yeah. like, at the time, I'm sure I was like, yeah, this is exactly what it's like. Adults are just like, no, you can't hear this. Yeah. Don't play outside. Absolutely, from that perspective. I understand that I'm not the target audience mm-hmm. for this book. But I do read a decent amount of children's fiction, so yes. I don't feel like I'm totally out there. No. Um, so that is something that I personally find annoying, but like you said, if you were 12, it would make a lot of sense. So I don't necessarily hold that against the book. It was just something that I was annoyed by. Yeah. And I think it's yeah. because at some points I felt like she used it as an excuse to not mm-hmm. tell me things or to not explain like certain mechanics and stuff mm-hmm. because it was like, oh, well, we're not going to explain it to a 12 year old. So. Yeah. I don't have to explain how magic works. I don't have to explain how this works. I don't have to explain how this works. Like, it's like, uh, you know, you don't. But, like, at the same time, I feel like you're using her age as an excuse to not tell me. Not that, like, you couldn't tell me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, basically, so the stranger shows up, right? And then her dad. Oh, yeah, he kind of, on track. <laughs> he, he, he freaks out. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't freak out. He knows who the guy is. And then he's like, all right, we got to move. And apparently that's a theme recurring in their life. You know, her only, Maggie's only constant is books, which was, you know, relatable to me as a child. And they go to this castle kind of fortressy place where they meet Eleanor, who is her aunt, correct? Yeah, I don't remember if she's an aunt or a great aunt. I think she might be I, I a great she's... aunt. No, I think she's aunt, because I think uh, the mom's her sister. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. She yeah. is the aunt. So she's okay. her aunt, and she has, like, a giant collection of books. Just that her house is, like, brimming with books, and Mo can basically come and, like, fix her books up for her. So, yeah, in return for her, like, housing them and stuff. Yeah. For a little while. While they're on the run. Oh, and the stranger's name is Dustfinger, and he comes along with them. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. Mo's a softy. Yeah, because Mo is like, ah, fine. And like, we, d- we because we're Maggie, don't understand why, but. Yeah, and at that point in the book, I was like, Dustfinger comes off as like sketchy, but also mm-hmm. like trustworthy. And I don't know how she managed to get that feel, but like, mm-hmm. that's his vibe the entire book is you're yep. like, wow, I really like this character and I think that he's good at heart. But also, I feel like he's really sus. Yep. Super flaky. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like, and he acts, he does fulfill both of those roles. He does. And it's just really interesting. I think he's the most interesting character. Yeah. But I think he also has the most volatile morality. Yeah. And decision making paradigms throughout. So. And I mean, it's hard because we don't have a lot of his backstory until pretty close to the end of the book. And even then, you yeah. don't really get a full backstory. It's just more like, yeah. this is why he has beef with this one guy. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, okay. So, cool, cool. cool. Yeah, he's, he's, he's that mysterious. I wouldn't, like, call him an anti-hero, but... No, I don't think he's quite that. He's more like a rogue, I guess. yeah. Because he does the right thing, and he, like, wants to do the right thing, but he doesn't always do that. Yeah. And it's, like, sometimes he doesn't do the right thing because he's, like, anxious or, like, scared of, like, very normal, like, realistic things. And I'm, mm-hmm. like, yeah, no, I I can totally see that. He's very relatable that way. Yes. Yeah. So, basically, they're chilling at Eleanor's house. Oh, there's been a book. And there's been a book that he that Mo has clearly been trying to keep hidden from Maggie. Mm-hmm. So she knows something's up. Yeah. And they're hiding it somewhere in the giant library, you know, with all yes. the other books. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what? How exactly does it? So I know. So Dustfinger agrees to do this fire show for Maggie, which is like I, that was so cool to me as a kid. And it was still cool mm-hmm. reading about it as an adult. Yeah. Um, and I was like, man, I, I wish this scene was longer. <laughs> I don't 
I don't know what I wanted her to say more about like the shapes that fire was making or whatever, but yeah. I was like, it seems really cool. Yeah. So he's doing this performance for her on the lawn. And but then, he has to do it at night. So yeah. he tells Eleanor, Eleanor has a alarm system. Alarm system. So he tells her that they're going to be outside late at night. And so she needs to turn it off so that Maggie and he can get back into the house. Cause they're both. Sus. Safe. <laughs> so yeah. Sus. And immediately I was like, Oh no, no, not my dust finger. Okay. Whatever. And then, um, I mean, is it that much of a spoiler? Yeah. Okay. So dust finger has betrayed them. The big bad guy's yeah. name is Capricorn, which we have learned and heard a couple mm-hmm. times at this point. Um, and so Capricorn's, men show up to the house and they kidnap Mo and they find the book and then they yep. leave. So and then Dustfinger also leaves. So Maggie is now alone with Eleanor. Yeah. And I think we should also clarify like Eleanor doesn't really like kids. Yeah, like, and she doesn't she, really know what to do with them. She really just likes books. Yeah. Kind of purposely chose to be a spinster type thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so her being with Maggie is not, like, excellent. Ideal. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, she's not gonna, like, she knows, like, that Maggie needs to, be, like, be fed and, like, taken care yeah. of. She's not, like, she's not, like, stupid. No. Or, like, ignorant when it comes to taking care of kids. It's just she doesn't really like kids and she doesn't really want to deal with Maggie. But, like, obviously she's, like, well, your father has disappeared off the face of the planet, so we're gonna wait here for a few days. And, like, they call the police mm-hmm. and everything. So it's not like she's, like, completely neglected yeah. for, like, adult responsibilities or anything. Um, yeah. But Maggie's like, no, because they took that book, and now we have to go find him. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what they do. I was going to say, I don't remember what point Dustfinger comes back. Or he comes back um, right away, and he's like, I know where they went, right? Something like that. Oh, yeah, he comes back. I can't remember if it was a couple days later or not, but he comes back and he tells Maggie he needs he's supposed to take Maggie. No, they got the wrong book. That's what's wrong. Oh, yeah. They think they think that they stole the the right book, but then it was actually the wrong book. Because Eleanor took the book Mm because she wanted to read it. Yes. Just coincidentally, which was actually hilarious and so in character. Eleanor is a great character. I mean, I know I made her out to be a little mean. She is a little mean, but she's just like pretty funny too. And uh, yeah, she's not bad. Yeah. So yeah, so they got the wrong book. So Dustfinger comes back and he tries to convince Maggie to get the book, and then just him and her will go to Capricorn. Mm -hmm. Capricorn wants the book, and Eleanor is like, "Um, no." I'm coming with you. And I was like, you should have said, no, we're not going. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. (laughs) But whatever. So they spend a whole bunch of time traveling. Dustfinger takes them to Capricorn. He's got like this whole village. He's like the big bad guy. And yeah, yeah, I don't know if we should go much farther. Like this is a lot of spoilers once you get to this point. I mean, I don't feel like it's that far into the book, but this book is 500 pages long. So... We can also explain, okay, so the thing that's connecting all of them, the reason they want this book, I don't feel like this is that big of a spoiler, is... I mean, it says it on the back of the book. Yeah, it it implies it on the back of the cover, is that Mo can read things out of books. Yes. And so Dustfinger is a character from a book who, like, emerged into our world, and so is Capricorn and some of his men. Yes. And they want... They, Capricorn, doesn't ever want to go back. And so basically he's trying to get rid of, he's trying to get what he wants out of his own story and then destroy all the other copies of the book because he wants to take over our world. He's a villain. Yeah, he never wants to accidentally be put back into the book. Yeah, whereas Dustfinger wants to go back. And so the reason he's kind of involved is that he actively wants Mo to read him back into his actual life. Yeah, but the twist is that Mo has no idea how his power works. Yeah. And he has never been able to read anything back into a book. And he mm-hmm. doesn't know. He can't, like, pick and choose what he reads out of the book. Mm-hmm. So and there seems to be kind of a, one, a one-to-one a one swap of things when things come into the book and out of the book. Like, something goes in for everything that comes out. Yeah, and you don't have any control over that either. Yeah. Other so, than 
purposely mispronouncing things can make them not come out of a book. But yeah, that's like you got to read it in the right way. Mm -hmm. You got to read it as it's written, I think. Yeah. So that's that's the basic plot. I mean, a lot of other stuff happens, but yeah, I don't know. You know, the whole the whole thing is Maggie is trying to get her dad and kind of the book back. Um, and then yeah, Dustfinger's trying to get the book. Eleanor is just kind of along for this ride. Yeah, <laughs> and Capricorn's trying to destroy all the books and also yes. force Mo to read out a certain character from his book. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. a lot right. of back and forth in this book. Yeah. Where like you're like, oh, you go to the town and then they try to leave the town and then they end up back in the town and they end up split up and then mm-hmm. like Eleanor goes back to her house and then she comes back again and Maggie escapes from this and then she ends up back and then Mo is MIA for a while and then it's like it's a mm-hmm. lot of yeah. like when we said a lot of travel, it's not necessarily all just like a lot of like long bits of travel, but it's a lot of they leave and then they get captured and they come back and then they escape again and then they get captured and come. And it's like a lot. And the thing that I remembered, the reason I said at the beginning of this podcast that I kind of got the books blurring together is because what I remember was them going into Inkheart, the book itself. And that apparently does not happen in this book. So the first book yeah. I basically remembered almost none of. <laughs> oh yeah. And that's the title of the book in the book is Inkheart. So yes. So the book is named after the secret book in the book. Yes. Which is great, Um, honestly. Yeah. But they don't do any of that in this book. No. And so it's kind of interesting, like, seeing all the lead up to it. And she does a really good job of, like, building tension and, like, making Capricorn seem like a pretty scary villain. Although I think you pointed out that he doesn't really do that much in this book. No. I mean, he just... Yeah, he's not, like, that super, super interesting. I mean, he's got, like, a lot of henchmen, and I don't understand, like, what exactly they do. Mm-hmm. You know? I'm like, yeah. you guys, you got, like... There are You have, like, 30 to 40 plus people, like, working for you. I'm like, what are they all doing, though? It seems like they just kind of, like, mill around this town and, like, and, like occasionally set gardens. things on fire. Yep. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? I don't get it. The 20th century or 21st century. Yeah, except not all of them are from the book. Most of them yeah. are. Yeah, some of them are just local hoodlums. Yeah, which is so, like fine. But it's just, I don't know. I, I didn't understand Capricorn's village at all. Like, yeah. he's got this I whole mean, town and I'm like, I get it. But I also don't get it. I don't reason- understand what they're doing. The reason that they had to find Mo is because they actually did find another person who can do the same thing that Mo does, has the same yeah. magic, but he has a stutter. So yeah. he doesn't read things out perfectly the way that Mo does. Yeah. Uh, Which is funny reason- because that's completely glossed over that there's more people that have this like special power. Yeah. Like how many more are there? Yeah. 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 So it's, the reason I bring I bring that up though is because he's ob- he's paying them with like stuff that this guy reads out of the books. So slash recruiting he's read some other people out of the books to recruit them, but yeah, yeah. So there are like there's like ways that Capricorn, but it's not entirely clear what his grand plan is. So yeah, he's like oh he like kind of wants to like rule the whole world, but I'm like you're starting in this tiny nowhere village in like Italy. Yeah, and What's I, your and I plan? it's unclear how much he actually knows about our world or how big it is compared to his world, like, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's very weird. Like, they imply that he's, like, moved around some. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, I'm like, okay, but, like, what are you doing? He's waiting for Mo to read out his companion because his companion's super, super powerful. Mm-hmm. Like magic wise and so then he's yeah. like then I'll just take over the world and I'm like yeah but you don't know like anything about this world like what do you mean you're gonna take over the world oh well but that's a question you. I feel like that's a question that I've only developed as an adult though like taking yeah, over the world what is you're just like oh yeah you gotta take over the world because you think that it's just that easy mm-hmm. it's well like, it's also like once you've taken over the world what are you gonna do exactly like run a government I guess that's what yeah. you have to do because now you're yeah. in charge of things. 
And that sounds like not fun at all. Exactly. <laughs> this is why this is why all of our billionaires are, you know, I mean, some of them dabble in running for president, but some of them are just like, I'm going to go to space. And you're like, yeah, I really hate that that's what you're doing with your money. But also, I guess I wouldn't want to be in charge of the world either. So, yeah, no, for sure. I don't want to be I barely want to be in charge of myself. Yeah, I don't want to do things. So, yeah, if I had I mean, a lot of money and I could afford to not do anything, sure. I do want to do things. I just, you know, most of those things don't involve, like, actively controlling a large part of the world. So. Yeah, they don't involve, like, big responsibilities. Does this just mean we're, like, slackers? <laughs> no, it means we lack ambition. <laughs> Yeah. I wouldn't say that we're slackers because both of us have had roles in our lives where we have been in charge. And, yeah. you know, if we are put in charge, I think both of us manage that pretty well. But neither of us have the ambition to, like, be in charge. Does that yeah. make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, we're decent enough so. when, like, we're put into a manageable situation. But, like, if we're if we can choose to not be put in that situation, we're fine following. Yeah. Whoever yeah. else is in charge, you know? If I can't do a better job, I'm not going to complain about it. 100%. Yeah, so Capricorn has some kind of plan, um, and he's just mostly being menacing in the background. Yeah. But the really, so, yeah, so it's like stuff happens, but stuff doesn't happen. They don't end up going into the book. They find a way, you know, like. It, to get rid of, some... I mean, is it a really a spoiler to kids' book? They get rid of the bad guy. Yeah. They figure it out like they yeah. they go on their adventure and then they go they basically go on their adventure and then they go home. And I'm like, OK, like, cool. That's a perfectly satisfying arc. Mm -hmm. But it's just so long. <laughs> it's just so long. And I the parts I remember liking are all in the book. So, yeah. And to be honest, even as an adult, if I was at a point in my life where I could read a 530 page book in like a few days, like if I had the time for that and the attention span for that I probably wouldn't have minded like most yeah. of that mm -hmm. but it took me over a month to get through this book yeah and reading it slowly just I feel like it compounded how slow it is for me yeah because and... I read the the last like 100 pages all in one sitting and you didn't even do that right I read the last 80 pages in one sitting but I almost didn't do that I almost split it into two sittings which I thought was wild. I thought I, I considered it when I was about halfway through the 80 pages. And I was like, no, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. You cannot do that. You will be a, just a failure in your entire <laughs> life if you cannot read 40 more pages right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I yeah. did. I read all of it. I don't know why it was so rough for me at the end. But I, I took a break of almost like two weeks because, because I, I got sick. Oh, yeah, you did get so sick. I wasn't eating. That's not your fault. But yeah, but, but I mean, I probably could have read sooner than what I did pick it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the end actually goes the fastest of any part of the book, so. Yeah, it does. There's not that much falling action. Kind of like, there's the climax, and then it's sort of like, okay, check off, round up all the characters mm -hmm. and figure out what they're doing, and then you just send them off, and you're like, okay, cool. And I would say the coolest character, so uh, obviously we already mentioned Dustfinger. Mo has a really cool job, but not a ton of personality. Yeah. Uh, Maggie is fine. She's pretty brave, and she, I'd say she does a good job of acting her age, which is kind of impressive. Yes, like, I agree I with that. I don't doing anything where I was like, oh, that a 12-year-old wouldn't do that, you know? Mm -hmm. That's uh, actually something I really, really appreciated about it. I know that I, like, I complained about how she's a kid so she doesn't like do exciting things and she's kind of like locked out of the adult conversations but mm -hmm. at the same time I was like that's very realistic and she's she's brave but she's not like so brave that it feels unrealistic Yeah. because sometimes you get kids books and there's like an 11 year old and they're like oh yeah no I'm gonna run right into this literal death battle and it'll mm -hmm. be fine and it's like no they probably yeah. wouldn't do that and yeah. so Maggie doesn't do those things, and I appreciated it, because I did feel like she was very realistically 12. I never forgot mm -hmm. that she was, like, 12 years old. Yeah. Which is something yeah. that happens in other books, where you're like, oh, I feel like this character is actually, like, 16 or 17, mm -hmm. but no, like, she's she's always 12. You get a reminder somewhere towards the end of the book, and you're like, really? 
what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're like, I didn't, I, what? No, never. Yeah. No, she's a, she's a good, and her emotions are really good too. I think they do a good yeah. job of, you know, when she's missing Mo and it it's, it's good. And then, so I, so I didn't, so reading this for the second time, I might've, I'm trying to remember if I ever reread it, but I don't think I, I have, I think I only read it the once. I, I'm, th- I'm thinking about my star rating here, by the way. Oh, but yeah? I can't given it one. You, you haven't picked one yet? No. <laughs> I mean, I only picked mine, like, 15 minutes before this we started recording, so um, it's like I really a can't war. talk. It's like a war between the nostalgia and, like, my more critical objective. I still kind of want to read the next book in the trilogy. It did mm-hmm. make me do that. But I think I can only give it, like, three and a half stars. Yeah. I think I settled on three. Mm. I initially thought two because I was like, oh, yeah, I remember how long and relatively boring it was for me. But then, like, thinking about it, I'm like, "Mm." no, because I think that if I did read this as a a kid, I would have enjoyed it. Yeah. I probably would have. For a target audience. Yeah. And I mean, I probably I think I didn't read it as a kid because I read Dragon Rider. Mm. And I didn't like Dragon Rider. And so then I was like, I don't know if I want to read another book by her. So you think if you had read this first, you would have still read Dragon Rider or? Yeah, I probably would have. Mm. I don't remember when I read Thief Lord, but I remember not knowing who the author of Thief Lord was when I read it. Mm. So that was the only untainted book that I read, I guess. (laughs) By Cornelia Funk. Because I read that one. I don't remember if I read that before or after Dragon Rider, but I know that after I read Dragon Rider, I was not keen on reading another book by her. Yeah. So, because I didn't even finish Dragon Rider. I didn't enjoy it. And I didn't enjoy it because it felt really long. Mm. Thief Lord, I think, is one of her shortest books. Yes, I was going to say. is really long, too. I don't think it's as long as Inkheart, but it is, it's up there. It's a lot of pages. Yeah, and then... I didn't... Did you end up watching the movie? No. I watched a trailer for it, and then I decided that I probably wouldn't enjoy my time watching the movie, so I did not. Yeah. Because I also remember when the movie came out and being kind of excited about it. I don't... Mm-hmm. I didn't, like, go see it opening weekend or something. I don't even know if I saw it in theaters, but I... It was disappointing. So. Yeah. Yeah, I remember you told me that, and I was like, yeah, that's how it is a lot of the time. I feel like there was, like, an era of, like, all book movies being absolutely awful. Mm-hmm. Or, like, the vast majority. And so then everybody got that reputation for, like, the movie being terrible compared to the book. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if Harry Potter revived it to be okay again. I or think it was, it was around just... the same time, though. Because Harry Potter went on for so long. Yeah, it did. Well, I mean, by the end of the Harry yeah. Potter movies. they I feel like they were kind of the exception for a little while. Them and, and then, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia movies weren't bad. They got worse and worse, wow. movie wise, as far as like following the book as they went. Yeah. The first one was fine though. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there wasn't like a whole era. But now well, it's all. Well, but Ar- Aragon so. definitely fell Awful. into the same category as Inkart. So trash. Yeah. yeah. Garbage. And I think there are some inherent like. This isn't a very visual... There are visual things happening, I guess, but, like, the idea of reading something out of a book is a bit weird to put into a movie. Yeah, and they don't actually go that much into detail in Inkart about how that actually, like, looks. No, it seems like things just just appear. Yeah, but, like, like, how do you show that visually, like, in a movie? You don't. I don't know, because everyone also kind of, like, goes into a trance almost, listening. Like, it's Mm -hmm. like you can't help but listen to him when he's reading. Yeah. So... It'd be it it'd be very difficult to translate that well on screen. Yeah. So. Well, I hear and, they didn't do a very good job of it, so I guess that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. I don't. Would you want this ability, by the way? No. No. I would absolutely not. <laughs> you never. Do you do you like reading aloud? Um, I do. I actually kind of miss reading aloud. When I was in high school, I used to read aloud a lot more. Mm-hmm. I read an entire book out loud to one of my friends. I became an audiobook reader wow. for an afternoon. 
I was a little into it already, so I gave her a summary of like the first, I think, three to five chapters. And then I read the entire book to her over the course of the whole day. Wow. And that was really fun. I um, and I really enjoyed that. But I haven't done that in a long time. That was back when I was just confident enough to do fun voices. Mm, Yeah. Um, But now I'm not confident at all. (laughs) (laughs) You've lost your confidence in your voice. I have. I used to watch a lot more BBC. I could do fun accents and stuff. Now I can't. (laughs) I've I've never had very good accents. But I do like reading for, like, little kids. And I've done that. Which is the sad thing for Maggie is that she grew up and her dad never read aloud to her. Yeah, because he was afraid. Mm-hmm. Which it's like, makes I'd sense. I'd be afraid too. Yeah, but it is like pretty sad that she had to just, you know, Not because there's that. there's something different about reading to someone versus yes. reading on your own. I and, distinctly remember my mother reading the Doctor Seuss story. What was I afraid of? And she always gets to this one page where the character, like, yells. And she yells at that page. (laughs) And it was always so good. It would always startle me every time. And it was still great. I love it. Yeah. My mom used to read us the monster at the end of this book. The one with Grover. Uh Yeah. Yeah. And I just remember her getting, like, so dramatic with, like, every flip of the page. And, Mm -hmm. like, you know, he's, like, moaning and wailing and being like, no, don't turn the page. Yeah. Yep. So it would... I mean, it'd be kind of, it'd be cool, but also the fact that he can bring people who are sentient out of books is, is pretty concerning. Yeah, that's, that's kind of terrifying, honestly. Yeah. And the fact that, like, he doesn't know how to control it or anything, mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, well, if I could control that power, maybe. That'd be cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, like, if it's exactly like it is in this book, where, like, like he has no idea how to work it, really, and he doesn't necessarily understand how to read things back into the books mm-hmm. then no although and, like, it doesn't... the stuff that goes into the book doesn't like become part of the story so I don't even know how you would read it out like I nobody mean, gets that part at all I think well first of all he does clarify that it has to be a good book like it has to feel relatively real when you're reading it or whatever okay. for anything to come out of it but then also I think there's the implication that the story is still like a fixed point in time. Like, like when he reads things out of him, it doesn't change the book for everyone else. Yeah. Which I thought so. was an interesting touch. Mm hmm. Thought it it's was more kind like of odd. It's, it's more like if you left a parallel universe, but like it was just a version of you, I guess. You know, like if you, it was just yeah. you, that moment in time, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, it would be because, like, they don't know how their story ends Yeah. when they come out mm-hmm. of the book. They just, they're just suddenly not there anymore. But they're still, like, their character still exists in the book. I wonder if that means you could read out the same character multiple times. Oh, my gosh, that'd be crazy. Like, at different points in their life. And, like, like, if you read them back, the part that I was wondering about as well is, like, you retain all those memories, so then you're just, like... You know, if you found out how your story ended, would you go back knowing that and not be able to change it? I don't know. But then, like, would you really experience that? Because if it's just you from that fixed point in time and the story is fixed, then you're not that that version of you isn't experiencing the end of your story. It's only experiencing that moment in the story. Yeah, I don't know. It, It is pretty pretty complicated when you start digging into it yeah which is probably why she just doesn't explain it in this book <laughs> <laughs> well you probably i don't know that she ever really explains it even in the later books and i yeah. i think that's also fine like you can just accept yeah. okay well this is how it works and that's whatever yeah i but, definitely don't mind that for like weird special abilities mm-hmm. is when they're like largely unexplained yeah and I'm like that's fine like i don't need a complex explanation of how this magic works or even how magic works in ink art because they have like some weird magic things Mm -hmm. that like kind of work in our world but then also like some things don't Mm -hmm. and it's like okay i don't understand (laughs) but But it is kind of it's a world within a world so it gets even more complicated like i don't know i guess it it would depend on like what you're using to make magic i guess because 
for Dustfinger with the fire eating and stuff that he does, uh, which is just such a cool character trait to have, by the way. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Fire is just inherently cool, I guess. Yeah. Is my take. <laughs> he speaks a language that lets fire, he can like talk to fire. So, but he can't talk to it in our world. No, it like, he, it can doesn't kind listen. Of under, he can kind of understand it, but yeah, he can't directly control it the way he could in his world. So, yeah. Which makes sense in a weird way. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And then, it wasn't a bad book. No. The other the other character that I do like, who we haven't talked about at all, is Fared. Farid? Farid. Farid? Yeah. I'm like 90% sure that's how you'd pronounce it. Okay. Farid, who is read out as sort of a test on accident. Mm-hmm. When- they capture, recapture Mo, and they're like, you gotta prove that you can still do it, or that it's real, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And then he is trying to read out just, like, treasure or whatever, but then accidentally reads out a whole person yep. who is just, like, obsessed with Dustfinger, and it's the cutest thing. <laughs> yeah. Because he's, like, 16. Mm-hmm. He's like, Dustfinger's really cool, so he just follows him around. Yeah. I love that. To- Tries to learn to eat fire and keeps burning himself. And you're like, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> he's precious. Yeah. He is also, he was also raised with thieves though. So he's like, mm-hmm. he's got some useful sneaky abilities and stuff. Yes, he does. She did a good job of making me care about characters. Except yeah. For- yeah. I, Mo is just so bland. Well, and also the decisions he made, like, you're kind of like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> Yeah, if Mo were a spice, he'd be flour. <laughs> he'd be flour, but like not even good flour. No, just like plain white flour. He wouldn't even be like, I don't nice, know, almond flour. Or unbleached, no. Yeah. Yeah. He he just, I feel like he's trying to be a good dad, kind of, but then he also is just fine lying to Maggie since forever. Yeah. He does that a lot. He never explains to her, so she doesn't know about his ability until all this happens. Yeah, which is, like, like, the worst time to find out about it. Yeah, like, I'm like, I get that you couldn't tell her when she was really young, because that, she wouldn't be able to keep it a secret, and that's kind of a big deal, but Mm -hmm. by now, she's old enough to know. You could probably tell a 10-year-old. Yeah, and he's, like, actively running from Capricorn. Yeah. Basically her whole life. Yeah, like, it's a legit, like, threat to both of their lives. Yeah. I mean, because I he feel wants like, Becky for leverage. I feel like by the time she was eight or nine, he should have been, like, prepping her with some information. Mm-hmm. You know? But yeah. he really, like, he very much just holds all the information back from her. He really does not let her know almost anything. And even in times where it's like, okay, well, she needs to know now. Mm-hmm. And even in those times, sometimes he's still held back. Yeah, Eleanor has to kind of be like, tell her. Yeah. And he's just like, I wanted to protect you. And it's like, okay, listen, we're literally locked up in the cellar of this place. And this guy is trying to literally kill us. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell me what's going on? Yeah. And he still doesn't want to. Like, okay, she can only stay a child for so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting concepts in this book. There's a lot of beautiful description. Mm-hmm. I didn't laugh out loud. I, I'm trying to remember if I cried or not. Well, I didn't. I got pretty teary-eyed. I don't feel like this is really a spoiler, but they burn all of Eleanor's books. Oh, yeah. And I was like, no! <laughs> <laughs> that is terrible. Yeah. Ugh. I don't think I cried, but I was I was deeply wounded by that. Because, like, can you imagine if you just came home one day and someone had literally lit all of your books on fire? I'd be pretty sad. Yeah, I wouldn't be quite as devastated as Eleanor because, like, I am not living alone in Italy by, like, completely alone except for these books, but... Well, that, and she's also a book collector, so she actually yeah. has, like, really expensive books. So yeah. I'm sure they burned the equivalent of a decent amount of money in addition to just burning like very rare, mm-hmm. very important books. So it wasn't just 
like that they burned some of her books. It was that they were the most expensive and most rare of her whole collection, which yeah. is saying a lot. I don't have that many rare books, although I did just find another copy of a book with the cover that I like. Ooh. I bought it. I saw it at Goodwill and I was like, well, that's for me. So <laughs> now I have two yes. copies of it and I still don't have the dust jacket for one of them. Hmm. I was going to say, do you think it's realistic that Capricorn had almost every copy of Inkheart? I mean, I know they said it wasn't widely published, but how hard do you think it would be to get, like, almost every copy of a book? Um, It really depends on how many copies there were to begin with, and they never tell us. If it was, like, a small run, then, you know, there might only be, like, a few hundred copies of it anyway. Hmm. But... It seemed to grow some traction. Yeah, like and it's he weird had to readers. me. Yeah, it's weird to me because it's weird to me that they never did another run of it because yeah. I know that it's like technically a little bit older. Yeah. But I mean, they do multiple runs of so many books. Mm-hmm. Like even just even less popular books. You don't have to sell that many copies of the book for you to be for them to be like, oh, we'll do another printing of it. And they'll do, depending on demand, several thousand books per printing. So yeah. I don't know what year this is supposed to take place in. Well, there's cars. Yeah. But I mean the... So that limits it to the 19th to 20th century. Or you're the 20th to 21st century. So Yeah, the copyright is 2003. So they were definitely publishing thousands of books in the... Yeah. yeah. And especially because it, it seemed like it, it did get popular. Like maybe later in its life. But mm-hmm. even then, I mean, if it's if it's popular, some publisher is going to be like, yeah, I'll print a few more thousand copies of it. I guess I'm also unclear on what language it was published in, which might have an impact. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that it's might, not, since it was maybe, over in Europe. Maybe not that much of an impact, though. I don't I really don't know how many like Italian books are published every year or, you know, like. Yeah. We just lucked out because we speak English. Yeah, lots of things are published in English. Yeah, lots of things are translated into English, specifically for us. Mm-hmm. We're so special. We get all the content. Yes, we do. Thanks, Germany, for Cornelia Funk. Yeah. <laughs> and for all the Witcher said, books that I were written in Polish. I said that very Polish. blandly, but I did mean it. <laughs> Yeah, I I read somewhere that the reason her books got translated into English was actually because there was a little girl who spoke German who knew someone at Scholastic or something and was like, why aren't you publishing my favorite books in English? Oh, huh. That could be a complete antidote that I just made up, but I feel like I read it somewhere, so. Yeah. Well, you know, it makes sense. This is a Scholastic printed book, so. Yeah. I wouldn't put it past them. Fight for your authors. Yeah, I mean, that's really, like, what people have to do. That's not the first anecdotal story that I've heard with, that's, like, similar. Mm-hmm. Where, like, somebody's been like, hey, why aren't you publishing this book? And the publisher's like, oh, well, we'll publish it then. Yeah, you're, you're like, proof okay. there's a customer. Yeah. Yeah, so, Inkart, good book. Safe to read the kids. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. I, I'll i probably read the second book at some point because I already own it anyway. But I don't think I'm going to necessarily hang on to this copy of it just because. Eh. Find a young child to pass it on to. <laughs> that is honestly going to be difficult since my life is very uh, busy right now. But, you know, yeah. I'll keep an eye out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have a yard sale. So, you know. Oh, yeah. Maybe a young child will stop by. Yeah. Well, if they do, you can recommend it. I will. Any parting thoughts, Corey? No. I realized when we started that I don't have that many thoughts about this book. Well, it's... I feel like I kind of struggled. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's an interesting... It's hard to talk about it just because there is so much movement in the book. Yeah. It does... It feels like it's building towards something. And then there is a climax in the book, but I really feel like... The second book is where I remember things, so. Yeah. All right. Well, I gave it three out of five. You basically gave it three, three and a half out of five. Three is my base star rating, so it's the one that I use for neither super great 
uh, or super bad. So we gotta read a five. We gotta find a five. Um, I believe I already have a five that we read. Oh, did Mogwai? I get that five? I can't remember. Well, we didn't do a podcast about that one, so. Which one? Mog World. Oh, I don't know if I would give that a five. Really? Yeah, it's a super enjoyable book, but I don't know if I'd give it a five. What about The Man Who Spoke Snakeish? Oh, I'd give that a five. Actually, wait a minute. No, because the second half of that book was not as good as the first half. Well, yeah, but it was still excellent. Yeah, it was. Red Rising? Mm. I don't know if I'd give that a five. You wouldn't? How would you not give that a five? I don't know if I would or not. I'd have to reread it. Oh, my see. gosh. Well, we need to reread it. I mean, it. maybe, like, initially I'd give it a five. I feel like we read more books. I feel like when we weren't doing this podcast, I was a lot nicer <laughs> about mm-hmm. the books that we read. And now that you have to publicly give your opinion, you're like, oh, it was okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want people to, like, read it and be like, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Wow. I mean, I've always been kind of harsh with books. But mm-hmm. um, I think especially now, I'm a little bit harsher than I used to be. Although is, in some ways I've gotten nicer, so I don't know. It's all about balance, I guess. It's kind of hilarious because you keep picking very random books. Like, it's not like you're out here being like, this is the best reviewed book. Yeah, no, I'm just like, oh, this book I got for uh, $2 at a yard sale, so we're going to read it. <laughs> yep. Which, what are we reading next, actually? Oh, we are going to read Fearless Writing. I don't have it in front of me so I don't know the author off the top of my head but um it's a nonfiction, and it is a craft book craft mm. not meaning like paper cheese. mache and stuff like that or the cheese um just meaning that it's about like writing it's about being a better writer I guess I don't know I got I was... it for I think I got it for Christmas forever ago mm. and um I decided to finally read it that should be exciting. Hopefully. Your first nonfiction pick. Is it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I picked all the other nonfiction ones. Yeah, probably. I have one other nonfiction book that I have for us to read, and I'm nervous about it. Wow. I'm incredibly nervous about it. You're switching <laughs> tacks completely here. I am. I'm going to suffer for it, too. <laughs> Well, fearless writing is kind of short, so hopefully it's not bad. And um, usually books like that have a lot of blank space in them because they typically include like exercises and stuff mm-hmm. where you can like do a little writing as you go. So maybe there'll be some and we can do them and share them on the podcast. I don't know. Yeah, that could be fun. Read a couple of yeah. examples of our work. Yeah. We can practice our reading out loud skills and make things yeah. come to life. Mm-hmm. And uh, if anything crawls out of your computer, it is not our fault. And we are not liable. Thank you. Nope. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, that was um, our discussion and talks on Ink Heart by Cornelia Funk. Next time you hear from us, we'll be talking about fearless writing. So, yeah. Have a nice whatever you're having. <laughs> a good morning, good night, whatever, and everything in between and all that from my intro. Mm-hmm. All right, bye. Bye.